also known as 3IE. Uh, 3IE uh, is a global leader uh, in funding, producing, quality assuring, and synthesizing rigorous evidence. We support studies and reviews that examine what works, for whom, why, and at what cost in low- and middle-income countries. Uh, we're also a global advocate for the generation and use of quality evidence in development decision-making. Uh, before we start, uh, as you're probably all now very uh, used to, we'll have a few notes uh, on housekeeping. Uh, first of all, uh, please use the Q&A box for questions, not the chat function. Uh, you can use the chat function to introduce yourselves uh, to each other uh, and, and sh some shout outs. Um, when sending a question, uh, it would be helpful uh, if you have, uh, if you name the panelist you have in mind that you'd like to answer it, unless it's a, a question for the whole panel. Uh, if the event is disrupted due to any reason, we will shut it down and reach out to you over email. Um, the event is being live streamed on YouTube and shared on social media. Uh, and if you are joining on our live stream, uh, please leave your questions in the comments box. Also, we encourage you to tweet any questions, points of views on Twitter. Uh, if you do, uh, very grateful if you could tag uh, at 3 e news while you tweet so that we can further retweet your tweets. Um, Finally, uh, the, the session will have my opening remarks, then we'll have a panel uh, discussion, presentations and discussions, and we plan to have uh, about uh, 20 minutes uh, for your questions uh, to the panel. Um, so that should, should make for a very exciting and, uh, and uh, fulfilling session. Now um, to a few uh, sort of um, setting sort of scene setting remarks um, you know before I introduce our panelists I want to say a few words about the motivation for bringing this panel together in the first place the Swatch Bharat mission or clean India mission is a countrywide campaign initiated by the government of India in 2014 to eliminate open defecation and improve solid waste management it succeeded in reducing the practice of openification in India dramatically just before the pandemic hit us. 3IE has been involved in promoting uh, its latrine use message through our evidence program on promoting latrine use behavior change messaging on latrine use. However, it is likely that the pandemic is interfering uh, with key with the key message of the SDM, namely that of toilet use. We are all encouraged to stay home and wash our hands due to COVID. But is this message, messaging uh, also causing people to stop using community toilets? The most vulnerable populations, which may have limited access to toilets of their own, are the most likely to be affected by issues related to community toilet use in the times of COVID. So we hope the panel discussion will describe the potential impact of the pandemic on the gains achieved by the Swatch Bharat mission and the existing systemic issues it has brought to light. We will focus on a positive way forward uh, by considering the way to use evidence and policy to address these issues going forward and come out of this having achieved positive and resilient social change. I will now uh, introduce our five impressive panelists with whom we will be having this discussion. So let me start with Sumitra Kay. Uh, she's the monitoring and evaluation lead of the Department for Monitoring and Evaluation Office at NITI IOG. Sumitra has worked as a petrophysicist in the oil, of, uh, oil and gas sector with Schlumberger and was subsequently engaged as an expert with WAPCOS before joining NITI IOG. She has assisted on the High Powered Committee for Oil and Gas Sector, Exploration and Production Sector Reforms at the NITI IOG. She is the nodal for infrastructure and social sector reviews for the Honorable Prime Minister. Her current work includes a benchmarking study for water sector reforms 
Vision 2035 documents for data and use in public policy, and evaluation of centrally sponsored schemes for water and environmental environment sector. Next, uh, let me introduce Mera Mehta, who is a professor emeritus at CEPT University, Ahmedabad, and executive director of its Center of Water and Sanitation. She has over 40 years of experience in water and sanitation, urban development, and infrastructure finance. She has consulted widely, including for World Bank, WHO, ADB, UNICEF, USAID, DFID, and WaterAid. She was on the board of Global Water Partnership, a Stockholm-based intergovernmental organization, and is currently on the board of the Dutch INGO IRC. She has studied architecture and urban planning and has a PhD in economics. Next, uh, let me introduce Vey Rahman, who is a head of policy with WaterAid India. He is a system and policy expert with over 25 years of experience in multiple development sectors, such as health, water and sanitation, nutrition and education. He has been involved in research, advocacy, policymaking and programming on critical development issues from grassroots levels to national level, working with NGOs, research agencies and the government. He has a unique association with various flagship national missions in India, such as the Jal Jivan Mission, Swatch Bharat Mission, National Health Mission, and National Literacy Mission. On sanitation, he has been involved in several research studies uh, and uh, advocacy initiatives that cover issues such as access, coverage, financing, technologies, leadership, and best practices. Next, let me introduce you to Ruhi Sai, who is a senior consultant with Oxford Policy Management. She is a medical doctor with a doctorate from Oxford University and a public health degree from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she works with the wider determinants of health, including sanitation. And finally, but not least, uh, Nicholas Osbert is Chief for Water Sanitation and Hygiene at UNICEF India. Nicholas comes from a background of architecture and engineering, having earned his degree in architecture from the Paris Villemine School of Architecture with a spe specialization in urban development and his degree in water and sanitation engineering from the National School of Water and Environmental Engineering. Nicholas has 20 years of experience in WASH and public health in Africa, Latin America and Asia. And he currently leads technical teams working in 15 states across India for WASH programming, notably to support the Swash Bharat mission and the Jao Jivan mission. Uh, so welcome very much to this uh, amazing panel. Um, and now let me turn over to our first uh, panelist, uh, which is Ruby. Let me um, turn over to you. and. Uh, you have each panelist will sort of have uh, about five minutes of opening remarks. Um, and Ruhi, I believe, is going to talk about what the issue is, what is the impact, and what can be done about it. That's, that's a lot. Over to you, Ruhi. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so, without much ado, um, Marie has already uh, talked about what the issue is. Basically, we are sort of trying to look at what effect COVID messaging is having on the results that the Swaj Bharat mission has achieved. Um, and you know, the, whether it is going to sort of uh, result in a reversal of those gains. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, firstly, what the issue is in a bit more detail, and then uh, what may be the impact of that, and then how we can address that, yeah? Uh, so with regard to the issue, now this depends a bit on really whether the situation. Now, if you look at uh, the effect of COVID messaging in the context of toilet use, say in rural areas or in households who have their own toilets, it could actually have quite a, um, you know, it could actually help in re-emphasizing the need to maintain hygiene, use toilets, to wash your hands, and can actually have a very beneficial effect. We can bring in the additional message that you know you need to wash your hands because of COVID. But then, in addition, after toilet use, after these particular times, washing toilet, washing hands is very important. 
So in these contexts, it can actually have more of a positive effect, all this messaging, right? Uh, this, of course, assumes that these households all have adequate water, have adequate soap, but then uh, we do know that this may not always be the case. In fact, in a recent study which uh, Oxford Policy Management, where I work, uh, conducted in Bihar last year, we found that uh, with the SBN, there was certainly a very steep rise in households using toilets in rural Bihar. However, amongst those who didn't, uh, the, one of the main reasons cited was the lack of water. And this was particularly the case during summer months. So this sort of um, infrastructural issue can affect uh, how much the messaging is actually put into practice. And th these infrastructural issues bring us to the next setting. Uh, and this is actually the urban setting. So what can be the impact of this COVID messaging in urban settings, particularly in low income areas, uh, where a lot of people may use community toilets? And use of community toilets is quite high. So in a recent report, India Spend report, uh, using NSSO 2018 data, they found that about 43% um, uh, households actually use community bathrooms and 11% use community toilets. So that's quite high in terms of numbers. So now, not unjustifiably, one might expect that with all the COVID messaging about you know, social distancing, staying at home, not intermingling, maintaining hygiene, it might be the case that a lot of people who use these community toilets might prefer to go back to the old style of open defecation. And uh, what are the kind of reasons this may happen? So this is more to do with the kind of deficiencies that may exist in the current uh, uh, community toilet space, uh, beginning with firstly, for example, overcrowding. So the expected norms for toilet use are somewhere between 25 to say 50 per toilet seat. Uh, but um, uh, ORF report uh, looking at the sanitation support program of the World Bank in Mumbai found that they had managed to achieve a ratio of 190 people to one seat. Uh, and it's not uh, dissimilar in other slums. Uh, so given that there are more than four to five uh, times the number of people who should be using toilets who are using these toilets, um, one would expect crowding and that could put people off. The second would of course be the lack of any hand washing stations. Even more so, even if there are stations, the lack of water, lack of soap. The next would be that uh, ventilation, which can be quite poor in these uh, toilets. And given the increasing move now towards concluding that it is not just person-to-person -person droplet transmission, but the possibility of aerosol remaining in the air for almost three hours, you know, especially when there's poor ventilation, when there are indoor environments, uh, this can play quite a negative uh, effect as well, right? Uh, so uh, this can be an additional factor. Um, the final one, which again, a lot of research is being done on is with regard to squat Indian toilets or Western toilets without a lid, where there is some thinking now that with flushing and with this pressure, there is the toilet plume, which might result in aerosolization. And again, posing a risk in the situation of uh, poor hygiene and poor ventilation. So given that these sort of conditions could justifiably result in a decrease in toilet use, what could be the impact of this decrease in toilet use? Now, this depends on the time horizon. Uh, so another study which uh, my colleagues uh, at Oxford Policy Management undertook together with uh, the Center for Social and Behavioral Change, uh, YCOM Media, and uh, with uh, uh, BBC Media Action and BMGF, um, looking at Navrangi Ray, a television program which was trying to present fecal sludge management in a kind of entertaining manner. This One of the findings was that fear-based messaging works for a short time, but then after that, people sort of, you know, the risk perception decreases, they get back to their normal life, so it's possible that initially the COVID messaging results in decrease in toilet use, but then after that, people sort of start going back to, you know, using the toilets. However, there is a difference here. Now, the risk of slippage not going back to the original level 
is higher because A, this may be a recently acquired behavior, and B, given that there are all these infrastructural constraints which are real and which people are now aware can actually contribute, right? So what could be the impacts of this increase in open defecation, which we could assume might actually continue for longer? So one would, of course, be the reversal of the uh, you know, gains of the SBM. Second, the impact of this increase in open defecation with regard to public health. Given that already there is a lot of you know, uh, unfinished agenda of the SBM with regard to treatment of fecal sludge, the focus has been on toilet use, but you know you need more of a focus on fecal sludge. So given that with that problem already being there, the increase in open defecation, and then some findings now of the coronavirus in fecal matter, uh, though of course we don't know the extent to which, how long the virus remains alive, whether it can contribute to fecal oral, fecal -oral transmission, but basically the public health benefits of this increase in open defecation. So given that there are going to be these public health impacts, this kind of reversal, what can we do about it? Um, so first, perhaps if we try to push toilet use uh, in the context of COVID, that may not be such a good idea if it is done uh, without any caveats, given that there is a real possibility of increase in infections of COVID. And in fact, this is not an uh, you know, this is not an imaginary scenario because there has been some research where they suggest that the increase in COVID in some of the slum clusters in Mumbai may well be related to the use of community toilets, right? So mm -hmm. what, what do we do? Uh, so one thing is, of course, that uh, there's a short term and a long term. So with regard to the short term, while we still wait for these infrastructural aspects to be addressed, then how, we can, how can we uh, advise people to take to continue open defecation but take adequate care so there are these really lovely uh, posters and um, videos which have been designed by the gates foundation <coughs> and put on a site indiafightscovid.com and the csbc also has got this covid dashboard where there's a lot of social and behavioral messaging which could be drawn on uh, say with regard to you know how they very beautifully draw on this uh, rap-based uh, Bollywood movie uh, and have these pictures of people standing from, from each other, encouraging them, uh, apna turn aega uh, kind of uh, messaging, uh, where they stand outside the toilet in the open, uh, away from each other. Secondly, promoting the use of masks, even in the toilet, even if they are alone inside the toilet, um, you know, given the aerosol-based um, question mark. Other simple <clears throat> messages like the importance of washing hands before you go to the toilet so that you're not sort of risking somebody else. And even if there are no hand washing stations there, washing hands at home with soap, going back home and washing hands. Um, other simple tips like, you know, using your elbow to open the door and then possibly setting up tippy taps, which would require community involvement, which WaterAid already actually has and Raman would more, know more about that. Uh, there are already videos about simple sort of ways in which these tippy taps, which use very little water, don't require contact, could be used. So these would be the short things. Thank you. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay. Yeah, the, <laughs> the long term, uh, which is that uh, you of course need to involve the government in the addressing the longer, the larger systemic issues with regard to the infrastructure. Thank you very much, and I think uh, excellent overview. I think of, of both sort of the issues of uh, around infrastructure uh, deficiencies uh, in this situation, around the social distancing, and some ideas around uh, around uh, what to do about it. Now, let me uh, address uh, uh, let Raman come in next. I, I believe you will also address some of these existing issues that COVID has brought to light. Maybe focus on anything that uh, that uh, Ruhi has has left out, if, if at all, I can't, uh, uh, anything, but, but certainly maybe sort of going more into then what are the recommendations, what can we do? Thanks, uh, Mary, and thanks, Ruhi, for that excellent uh, overview. <clears throat> so I'll be mainly covering the, you know, COVID, how it posed a lot of challenges in front of the various achievements that has been, uh, you know, uh, made by the Search Bharat mission, especially uh, in front of the uh, poor and marginalized communities, both in the urban and rural settings. Uh, so uh, one of the things is uh, that, uh, you know, when we are talking about sanitation here, we need to also look at, uh, uh, Ruhi has already 
touched upon. So water and hygiene needs to be very clearly related to then only we can achieve this uh, discussion on sanitation well. So uh, one of the major challenges that I found was uh, when the COVID, uh, uh, you know, uh, outbreak happened, especially starting starting from the urban locations, uh, for the officials at the health department or at the, uh, you know, other national bodies or various other uh, sanitation or urban development department, uh, housing and urban development department, the, it was about issuing guidance, uh, you know, because in the urban locations, when you, when you uh, population level guidance needs to be uh, differential, it cannot be the same for everyone. So for those who are living in a very, you know, clustered kind of approach in a, in a, in a slum uh, or a, a very highly populated urban uh, poor settings. So that guidance needs to be different if compared to uh, the residents welfare associations and all that. And all the way for the rural, uh, the, the approaches are, uh, you know, the, the specific guidances needs to be very different. So one of the things that we tried to uh, understand was how can we help the urban local bodies or the rural uh, government or the gram panchayats to understand these issues uh, in detail in, in according to the very ground level situation and then look at the sanitation and water from uh, that perspective. So uh, one of the issues was, you know, for example, in the rural area, there are several water stressed areas. So you have to, uh, toilet usage is one issue, you have to promote it. And then you need to also promote uh, hand hygiene in a major way. Uh, in the urban locations, we can talk about uh, sanitizers or alcohol-based alcohol rubs and all that. But in the rural area where there is no water available in many places and there are, uh, you know, there's a need to promote hand hygiene. So how would you go about it? What kind of solutions, uh, you know, uh, the Gram Panchayat needs to take? So, for example, in Orissa, I've, I've seen a, one of the good uh, initiatives that the Gram Panchayat uh, chairpersons were given uh, some, you know, specific under the Disaster Management Act. They have given the Gram Panchayat uh, uh, chairpersons or the mukhiyas or, uh, uh, you know, sarpanch, whatever we call in uh, elsewhere in the country, equivalent powers of the district magistrate. Uh, for, you know, uh, doing whatever specific necessities that they need to fulfill in terms of fulfilling the uh, sanitation or water or hygiene or other health related requirements in the locality, including for uh, setting up the quarantine facilities or, you know, those kinds of things. So one of the things that we found was, uh, you know, the officials for, uh, we need to, in the urban area, how to differentiate uh, the roles, officials for the, the main areas and also for the urban poor settings, unless if they are different. And you know the water supply systems are, you know, if they are not made effective, how to make uh, uh, effective systems for ensuring physical distancing while people are collecting water from the tanker supply and you know related issues. So there were several kind of things. So we prepared some ten point uh, kind of recommendation for the urban areas, and similarly uh, for the rural areas, wherein they were about to. So in rural areas, there was an added challenge of you know a reverse migration was happening. The reverse migration from urban areas to uh, rural areas where the workers were settled in the urban setting, they were going back in a large number uh, to the uh, rural uh, in, uh, areas backward uh, uh, in return. So what, what the Gram Panchayas can do, uh, the schools or you know, various public infrastructure that is available in these locations were very limited. So how to ensure sanitation facilities, how can they set up kind of, you know, at least a stop gap arrangement uh, those kinds of things were uh, coming as a major issue. So the usage, uh, of course, you know, the sanitation uh, the toilet usage, uh, you know, is being challenged by this uh, uh, COVID situation. And there is a very, uh, there's a right time to think about how can we enhance and, you know, how can we ensure the sustainability of the toilet usage, whichever level we have achieved as part of the Swachh Bharat mission. So that is something that we need to discuss in detail at this point. So similarly, we need to also think about the sanitation workers because sanitation workers, uh, you know, when we are talking about sanitation or promoting the public and community toilets, the cleaners of that, the emptiers, especially when uh, virus presence and the virulence is very high in wastewater. So what is the kind of protection, safety, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, support measures that is needed to be provided to the sanitation worker. So there is a range of issues that, uh, you know, when we are talking about toilet usage in light of COVID, we need to address. I would stop uh, uh, my, you know, initial points here and we'll come up as and when things are coming. Thank you, Mary. Many thanks, Raman, and thanks for bringing in this, this contextualized issues. You're talking about how sort of 
uh, you know, putting in place systems and 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 uh, and, and sort of uh, um, uh, empowerment, empowering you know local authorities, etc., to localize recommendations. You're talking about the sort of the effect of reverse migration and the sort of further stress on local systems. Uh, and and of course, I think very important point. You know, to to do anything at this, how do we do this while looking after the the important. Uh, uh, sanitation workers, so, so ex, uh, you know, and, and their safety in, in, in the whole thing. Um, so excellent points. Let me uh, bring in Nicholas. Uh, I believe you, you're going to be talking about uh, ongoing work uh, by UNICEF and, and also some thoughts around ways forwards and uh, forward uh, ways forward and opportunities. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. 104 participants. It's great to see. Hope uh, you'll find the discussion interesting. Um, so. Quick, quick reaction uh, compared to the to to add uh, our view as UNICEF for um, uh, for the COVID crisis and, and the wash sector. I mean, uh, if you look at uh, the global experience that we can have, uh, we st I'm still very happy to be in a country uh, where wash programming is so well prioritized. I mean, in many places of the world where I've worked, you have to beg for a bit of attention for water, sanitation, especially sanitation and hygiene, and um, and so. This wash program has been prioritized. To, I give few examples, like uh, the Swatch Barat mission is entering in the phase two, which has even a bigger budget than the phase one. And, and this is a, an outstanding decision from the government uh, to make sure that the gains of the, the first phase are sustained and expanded. And it's really interesting to see that the focus is expanded, not just to ending open defecation, which is still an issue, but also to expand looking at fecal sludge management, solid waste, leaving the one behind, meaning that we admit that there are new households without toilets and, uh, and, and uh, hygiene and hand washing with soap. Um, then we also have the second biggest program or even the bigger program is the Jal Jivan mission on water supply. So uh, let's hope to make, I mean, I think the challenge here is to make the best of, uh, out of this investment in a timely manner, despite of the operational barriers brought by COVID. And, uh, and, and make sure that the implementation of those two flagship programs, SBM phase two and JGM, are, have a COVID sensitive lens, meaning they respect, that they, they promote social distancing and, and, and finding ways to operationalize these. Um, if, you, if you also look at other opportunities, hand washing with soap, uh, COVID, you know, constitute a, a clear drive for cleanliness. Yes, uh, the fear of the health issues shouldn't be the driver, but still, I feel that COVID did in six months, perhaps more than we collectively did uh, uh, in a decade for hand washing with soap. And, and, and we can build on that. And as we speak, uh, there is uh, all the partners, some of the uh, like WaterAid and others with WHO are working on, with the government to make a roadmap and to build so that the, the promotion of hand washing uh, doesn't stop with COVID, but continues with as possible behavior change approaches that are aspirational, not built on fear. Um, and uh, so there are many other opportunities like uh, these new ways of doing trainings, much more online that, that can be efficient, you know, the old way of doing cascade training and, and one day reach the last service providers that reaches the community, there you can go directly. Um, so it brought a lot of changes in what UNICEF does in the country. And uh, basically we, 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 we have two types of intervention, the COVID specific, which is really much the emergency response and the COVID sensitive. And uh, we have been able, I mean, it was a struggle to build those plans and to shift, to shift gears and to shift the way we work. Uh, but um, we, we, we are focused in, this, uh, in the response for both COVID specific and sensitive in three main areas. The, the first one, of course, is behavior change communication, looking at uh, social distancing, hand washing with soap, safe hygiene practices. And so to date, through our networks and, and investments, we have been managed to reach 38 million people. Uh, at the scale of India, this is not much, but this is still uh, quite, uh, quite important. Um, the second pillar is around infection prevention and control in communities and in key institutions, primarily uh, healthcare facilities, uh, schools and preschools. And uh, so this is very much on capacity development. And to date, we have been able to reach 400,000 uh, uh, workers uh, to, 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 for the provision of COVID-19 wash services in communities, schools, and health facilities. And um, the third one is um, all the work around supply and services, water and sanitation to affected communities. And uh, here we have in UNICEF a special focus, one on the uh, uh, dwellers in urban slums and migrants or people on the move. 
and this is about providing supplies, uh, hygiene items such as soap. So we have a great partnership with Unilever and we were able to provide 6 million uh, bars of soap to date. Uh, protective equipment, not for doctors, this is handled by WHO and the health team, but for sanitation and water and sanitation workers. Disinfectant, sanitary pads, and we also contributed to boost local production. Uh, I have great examples of uh, booze industry that were reconverted into producing uh, disinfectant. And so to date, we have been able to reach around 3.1 million uh, people in, in, again, in urban areas or, or people on the move. And so to conclude on, on this opening remarks, um, I think, so the, the challenges we face, uh, it's uh, mainly, and I'm glad to hear that uh, there are other agencies like really working on that, it's the lack of data. Uh, the regular monitoring systems such as MISS and, and household survey are not operational these days, so it's quite difficult. And, uh, and as we speak, I will elaborate a bit on what we do here to have alternative ways of knowing what's going on in the field, uh, question that were raised by previous panelists, uh, such as uh, how long is the threat in the environment? So we are conducting a, 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 a research in, in Ahmedabad to see in wastewater how long COVID resists. Um, so the, this lack of data is the main challenge to have an accurate response and again, an accurate drive of those flagship programs from the government. Issues of equity, indeed at a time where everyone is uh, under pressure, uh, there is less consideration and prioritization of most vulnerable uh, uh, part of the population and communities. And finally, an issue of the bandwidth, how much can we absorb? So I told you what we are doing in UNICEF, behavior change, infection prevention and control, but we still need to continue to provide technical assistance to those two flagship, and it's difficult to combine the two, the, the response to COVID and, and, uh, and uh, the, the making the best out of those big flagship programs. And we also see in the field, and I hope we can discuss that as well, it's the increased number of, uh, you know, there is a scarcity of service providers. And here there are very interesting drives, uh, both from the line ministries and the state government. We are working in 15 states, UNICEF, uh, to embark much more NGOs. And that's quite interesting. Uh, that's something new uh, to really make the interface between the Indian administration and the communities. So that's another opportunity. And something that was perhaps missed in the first phase of the Swatch Bharat mission is using the very dynamic private sector of India with the right regulation and the right um, uh, uh, business models and contractual models based on, on performances. I think there is a great opportunity to make use because there is big funding for those programs, especially from the government of India, but lack of service providers. So all the work around regulation, skilling and, and mobilizing small scale service providers can really help uh, to, to achieve services and especially to improve equity uh, uh, across those two big programs. Thank you. Fantastic. Th thank you very much. Uh, one thing that stood out from what you said is actually, you know, that, that COVID has done more for hand washing with soap than, than uh, decades before where we have tried to, to sort of uh, uh, campaign for that. So that, that's a, a great point. And then I think that the whole idea of seeing the, the SPM2 as, you know, the next phase as a great opportunity uh, to, to, uh, to address some of these issues around uh, behavior change around bringing, you know, various sectors and various programs together. So we don't have sort of avoiding any siloed approach, which we, we, we keep learning across programs that doesn't work. And, but still, it is so hard to, to, to break. Um, uh, and of course, very, very promising, it sounds, uh, uh, sort of interventions, both on COVID specific and, and, and sensitive uh, interventions that, that, uh, that you mentioned, Nicholas. And, and I'm always aware of the scale. You're talking about big numbers, but they're so small compared to, uh, so compared to the, the, the country of, uh, we're talking about. So, so you know, one, one thing is also, so how, how, how do we ensure that this is sort of, uh, is taken to scale? Um, but we can co come back to that. Uh, let me, um, and you mentioned one thing is sort of the, the need and sort of slight lack of, of, of sufficient data, et cetera. And let me bring in the, the next speaker uh, because uh, Sumitra, I think uh, you wanted to, to come in, I think, and your, your opening comments would be around the use of monitoring and evaluation and the opportunity to use this to develop more resilient uh, systems. Um, so over to you, Sumitra. Thank you, Marie, and uh, thank you to all the other panelists for introducing this session so well. So probably I'll pick up from uh, where, you, where, Marie, you closed about silos. So uh, today we are also looking at the whole issue 
in a holistic fashion and trying to say that you know a holistic inclusive and sustainable sanitation services sector for it to be maintained what are we looking at like what are the aspects that we are trying to you know monitor or evaluate to make it a very very uh, you know efficient and effective system so um, just you know uh, concluding kind of from what other panelists have said uh, a it is a multi context system where we are saying the problems of urban poor versus problems of rural poor are quite different so you know systems are designed and planned differently for them and the adaptation is also different then uh, it is a multi sectoral approach so we are talking about you know water supply for sanitation support then the environmental sustainability aspect of it creating infrastructure so it or you know ultimately it is going to affect the health in multiple manner both preventive uh, fashion and you know a lot of aspects are being uh, talked about and hence it is a multi sectoral aspect and brings in the need for convergence between multiple agencies again uh, bringing on to the next point it is a multi stakeholder system as well so when you have multiple contexts and multiple sectors involved you also have multiple players government non government infrastructure creation absolutely physical you know uh, deliverables versus something as intangible as behavioral change or social dynamics that play in the whole system so uh, you know when you talk about data systems or monitoring or evaluation for this entire ecosystem it's fairly complex and interrelated so how do you measure these complexities how do you define these complexities how do you define roles and responsibilities of multiple stakeholders and how they fit into each other these are all questions that we try and answer when it comes to mne so beginning there let me give you examples for example um, if you're talking about um, physical infrastructure it's fairly easy to monitor so the data systems exist so how many toilets have been constructed how many individual household latrines have been constructed and how many community sanitary complexes have been constructed so that is fairly measurable and easy to do but even within those infrastructure aspects like ruhi was talking about ventilation systems hand washing stations so these are also part of the infrastructure but are we capturing these granularities systemically for us to even understand what kind of services are being provided to our beneficiaries so that granularity part is where uh, we try to come in and you know handhold uh the entire ecosystem and try and say uh, apart from just counting toilets you also need to count the infrastructural facilities that go into making these toilets uh fully functional and also uh you know link it to environmental sustainability say water supply like uh it was earlier talked about uh by raman that you know uh, there are a lot of areas which are water stressed and how do you ensure you know different types of water supply is ensured within those systems then um, coming on to so so far i've mostly talked about monitoring more than evaluation because if you look at evaluation it's sort of an endline process a program takes 3 to 5 years to actually show some improvement or impact and then you take a year or two to actually conduct an evaluation completely and then you come back with results so that feedback mechanism is kind of long term and more detailed but monitoring systems if planned well and executed simultaneously give you short term real time feedback systems which becomes very very important in context of shocks like covid so when you're saying you have something so drastic as covid coming in and disturbing your whole plan then the system to respond and be agile about it you need to understand what the problems are not after a few months not after a few years but immediately hence the monitoring systems if made well build resilience and agility into the system so that is where uh, you know you have the whole responsiveness coming in again going back to the roles and responsibility part if you're talking about availability of water or availability of um, workers to clean and sanitize the facilities 
or availability of soap or consumable products or even menstrual hygiene products that come into the whole perspective um these have to have interlinkages with other supply chain systems so then who plays what role and even the distribution between government and non government roles so the whole system has to be looked at you know uh, it is temporally different it is spatially different and it is financially very very different so when you're talking about all these aspects then building robust data systems and monitoring systems kind of uh, give you a perspective of how to plan better and how to adapt better then uh, moving on um, what we also like just, one question just, that i saw just to say that uh, if you can finish in in a minute or so because we're running a bit over so uh, i'm just simultaneously taking the question in the chat panel so it also talks about like reverse migration putting more pressure on individual household latrines within households which were designed for a set number of people and then if there is reverse migration and people are moving back into their houses then you know you're not accounting for it then what do you do so you know those kind of uh, immediate actionables will take Uh, agility within the system and also feedback mechanism. So converting evidence that all of us here are involved in building into action is where the key focus, in my opinion, should lie on. So I'll probably close here, and I can take up specifics later. Thanks, Marie. Thank you, Sumitra, and, and very great point. I think you know it, it reminds me of what they always say, which is happens to be quite true: is what is counted. counts and 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 that's sort of one of the major issues that you're you're saying and we need to go beyond counting counting toilets so to speak uh to put the focus on on these additional issues uh one thing to 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 also mention is of course that you know i think that the world of monitoring evaluation maybe has has moved on a bit and and monitoring data are are excellent and can be used for good evaluations and so you you know the focus now is much more on Uh, implementation research where you could actually very quickly see you know by trying out new things you can evaluate whether a new uh, a new feature will lead to a behavior change and so so the the, the times when evaluation was five years after the the the, the program ended so to speak we, we sort of we moved beyond that uh, and i think and 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 having the monitoring data are, are very key to be able to do that kind of rapid uh trial and failure so to speak or trial and testing uh evaluations to to improve implementation and and so on so um great point let me bring in the the last but not least the uh, <laughs> mera uh, the last panelist um when i i from what i see you're going to to talk about sdm and the focus on individual household toilets uh, and and but also if you want to to reflect uh, on on what you heard from other panelists over to you thanks mari uh, just before i start uh, since everybody was sumitra and you both referred to monitoring i just wanted to highlight that uh, the center where i work center for water and sanitation actually we started with a very major project on performance monitoring of water and sanitation urban water and sanitation and we have been doing this over the last decade continuously we started in two states of gujarat and maharashtra across all cities and now we are in five states about 1000 cities all smart cities under the smart cities mission are being covered under that and we are currently in discussion with the ministry of urban uh, affairs housing whatever mova to take this uh, country wide so all 4000 cities so that's something that we actually have a quite a large database which covers these uh, 30 or so plus indicators for water sanitation and solid waste management in cities and we do this annually every year it's a online platform that has been set up and uh, the the results are available in public domain so it links up quite well to what both of you actually were saying about monitoring we also do provide a lot of so maybe you can also uh, ask uh, you know if we can actually get the link in the yes i will ask i hope somebody from my team is there and they will put up the link in the chat 
Uh, we also have been working with, uh, and I must say that this has been funded by Gates Foundation. Uh, when we started in, I think 2008, we were probably one of the first uh, institutions outside of North America and Europe to be funded for WASH sector and they took the risk with us and I hope we have actually fulfilled their uh, wishes. But anyway, so Gates has continued to support us and we actually currently are supporting government of Maharashtra for Swachh Bharat mission. You know, and that we have been doing, I think, last five, six years now. We worked with them to make urban areas, and don't ask me about Mumbai not being ODF, but we have been supporting government of Maharashtra to make urban centers open defecation free. In fact, we worked with government of Maharashtra to develop this whole idea of ODF plus and ODF plus plus, which is now being adopted by uh, government of India also and is being used everywhere. Our work currently with government of Maharashtra goes beyond only ODF, but looks more also at fecal sludge management. Because if you want to talk of safely managed sanitation, you can't stop only at the toilet and you have to manage the entire value chain. And that is the work we are currently doing. Again, it's a very ambitious program because it is uh, doing attempting to do this statewide across 300 plus cities in Maharashtra. And that's something that currently in progress, a bit slowed down because of COVID, but we are quite hopeful that. And it's largely being funded through public finance and local government own finance, in fact. So it's something that's quite unique in terms of what we are trying to achieve. Uh, and I also wanted to uh, highlight that we are also part of an alliance called NFSSM Alliance, that is National Fecal Sludge and Septage Management Alliance. Why I'm saying this is that this whole FSM idea has come out of a group of agencies or group of institutions coming together. And that is how this alliance has been formed. And that actually has helped us and our other partners also to put FSSM on the agenda. Uh, be before a few years, government was actually not ready to listen to FSM as being a solution uh, for safely managed sanitation as compared to, let's say, sewerage system. Uh, so that is some, a major mindset change that has happened and that we are actually quite, uh, I shouldn't say proud, but we are quite happy that we've been able to contribute it through this NFS Summer Alliance. To come to the topic of the day, I wanted to, before again starting, I think everybody mentioned hand washing. And when I was trying to write down some notes when you asked me yesterday, and I was reminded of the global hand washing day. In fact, that is now happening in another 10, 11 days. It is October 12th. And global hand washing day was started in 2008, as Nicholas rightly said, of a decade ago, more than a decade ago, 12 years ago. But I think in the WASH community, it is very clearly recognized that COVID has placed the importance on hand washing, which otherwise it was simply not there. And the whole decade of effort that was there, I think that has been uh, pushed up in a major way through the impact that COVID related efforts have been made. So that I think we need to keep in mind. I think the second major thing and that what we have found, and we work uh, with government of Maharashtra, but we also have teams placed in a few cities. And what we find is that, especially for women, the importance of having own household toilets is something that is becoming very critical. Uh, I'm, I wouldn't say that it's only due to COVID, but COVID has actually, we have been working on this idea for a long time, but I think COVID has helped to again articulate this requirement in a major way. And that is something that, and I, in that sense, I think the whole uh, SVM focus on individual toilets linked to ODM, but in, on individual toilets has been validated by what is happening because of COVID. Uh, unfortunately, in many low income communities in uh, dense settlements and in uh, cities like Mumbai, Pune, and many others, uh, 
a large number of households still rely on community toilets. And as everybody has said, and what we found was that, in fact, when we started documenting initially on what was the COVID response, there were very positive response in terms of trying to, you know, uh, community toilet manager also meant uh, uh, keeping social or physical distance in uh, community toilets and so on. But that our new our partners who are working on at the ground in Mumbai find that that is actually not happening anymore. So those are concerns that are certainly there. Uh, some four to five million households depend on community toilets. And I was just looking up the recent ORF, not very recent, but the ORF survey done. And those who speak Hindi would uh, uh, realize the title of that survey, which says, Jai to Jai Kaha, which is a Hindi song, but that is a very apt title for the, the survey that they've done. And they found that, in fact, 80% of the service households were ready to build their own toilets. And they didn't want even money, but they wanted a sewerage connection. And this is something that was not forthcoming from Mumbai Corporation. And this is true for many cities in Maharashtra also, although a lot has also happened. We currently work in a city uh, in Maharashtra, Kolapur, where uh, one of the NGOs that I think UNICEF also works with, Shelter Associates, has done very exemplary work and they've tried to provide uh, uh, sewerage and drainage link to uh, own toilets. We work in Ahmedabad. We've supported Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation on their slum networking program, which has actually provided drainage connections and water connections in all slums in Ahmedabad. So there are possibilities and there are ways to do this. The other thing that has come up is the need for yes, yeah, need the to last point. Okay. Last point that what is also emerging is that uh, the incentive that is being provided under SVM is still not sufficient to make your own toilet. And that's for access to credit or CSR funding is very, very important. And again, we've been working in uh, cities in Maharashtra with our local institutions, Marvim, to create linking self-help groups to bank loans. And that is something that we have done in one of the cities. So that is, those are things that, and there are CSR grants that are also possible. I think these are experiences that we need to take forward. And my take on COVID, and this is the last line, that we need to look at the opportunity that COVID has also created rather than only be overwhelmed by the problems that it has put before us. And that, I, if we take that attitude, I think going forward, we'll be able to do a lot in the space, sanitation space. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much, Mary. And thanks for bringing the sort of uh, uh, perspective from Maharashtra state and, and sort of getting a local a state flair to the, to the discussion. I think a very... Uh, very interesting, and then I think you know you all heard a sort of a, a strong uh, sort of plea or, or, or a strong uh, argument for for household toilets uh, and and, uh, and and sort of uh, how to promote that. But uh, but at the same time, we know that a lot of people do not have that opportunity, and 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 you know we've we've been discussing. So so what about how to make the community uh, toilet safer? So let me. Um, this is going to be the challenge of the day for this panel. I, I'm realizing. I'm going to let you only have one qu one minute to answer. Uh, there's a question for each of you, but uh, only one minute, and and just sort of just just say the main thing you want to say to that issue, um, because we don't want uh, the additional minutes you take. You're taking also away from a very, uh, you know, from the audience, so who might want to sort of ask you further questions, and, and we want to bring them in. Um, so, so let me see. The first first question, which goes to to Ruhi, uh, is when you talk to people, uh, what are the commonly cited barriers to the adoption of supportive behaviors? When you're on mute. So again, uh, in the context of um, COVID, this uh, and hand washing it would, and uh, sanitation, it would depend rural, urban. So our rural Bihar study supported by 3IE uh, indicated that the main barriers there seem to be with regard to the intention to use uh, these sort of behaviors like toilet use. So the intention was not there because you know people 
did not have knowledge about how fast the pit fills, how to empty the pit, that it gets decomposed. So the intent was the main thing. But then another Oxford Policy Management study is, uh, related to what's up work in urban sanitation in Lucknow and um, in Vishakapatnam suggests that in urban areas, people have the intention, they want to use the toilet. But here, what interferes with developing the habit is infrastructure. And you know the fact that toilets may be very far off and then all the other sort of things that we've uh, talked about with regard to lack of proper hygiene, ventilation, and that sort of thing. So I think it depends on the area and the context. And broadly, there can be barriers to forming the intention and then barriers to carrying out that intention, doing the behavior and developing the habit. Thank you. Uh, and um, and also, I think, you know, a very good point that it's, uh, it, it's sort of the, the barriers will very much be uh, context specific. And, and uh, in the former, it sounds like the knowledge uh, intention related to knowledge around things like pit filling, you know, is, uh, and, 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 and how to address that will be very different from a place where effectively the infrastructure is deficient. Um, excellent point. Just also to add, I didn't say that explicitly in my introduction, but the, the, the three IE latrine use program we referred to was also uh, uh, supported and funded by, by Gates. So very much uh, uh, an area that Gates is, is, uh, is, is uh, you know, a champion of and, and, and supporting the knowledge and evidence uh, in. Um, let me then uh, turn to Raman uh, for the second question. Have you been able to do any outreach activities related to toilet use? And if so, what have these been? If not, what has been presenting you? Uh, thanks, uh, Mary, for this. So one, you know, uh, we, ha we have been uh, engaged in one of the research projects uh, uh, funded by the 3AE on uh, promoting toilet usage in rural areas. So this was done in Karnataka last year. So in continuation to that project, we are now helping uh, some of the districts for making a district level a plan for the uh, SBM 2.0, which is uh, mainly focused on uh, usage, promoting usage and you know, looking at the impediments for usage and then to address them, how the district can plan for that. And uh, in addition to that, in Madhya Pradesh, we are helping the uh, government of Madhya Pradesh for uh, you know, making public and community toilet, the designs that uh, can be accessible but on the other hand, you know, as, as the question is related to COVID, uh, this uh, uh, it was not easy to do, uh, you know, these kinds of activities at this point in time. So that is where, you know, we conducted a study on sanitation workers situation during the COVID and also hygiene situation. What all are the difficulties that people are facing in terms of, uh, you know, hygiene practices and then to suggest uh, remedial for that. And also uh, how to prepare our schools, you know, that is one of the questions also. So though there, there are a lot of activities, uh, you know, that is required. As Meera said, we, we, we were, uh, you know, seeing this as the opportunity for uh, using the, uh, the primacy that the wash sector has uh, got during the uh, COVID period. So how to use that and then to establish sustainable points was the uh, kind of uh, focus that we were uh, having. There are a lot of other things, but in want of time, I'm not going into that. I can maybe address during the question answer. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. And, and we have one quick question just for you too. And maybe if you, uh, you know, the, the kind of recommendations you have to the sanitation workers, uh, the study you talked about, et cetera, are there some guidelines that have come out of that that you can share with the, with the audience? Definitely, I'm just putting the link here. Excellent, thank you. Um, then uh, let's let's move on uh, to Nicholas. Um, how has your work changed as a result of COVID? All right. Uh, to be very short, then um, I, I want to mention about those new monitoring system and messaging system that we have been forced to adopt because of COVID and and the fact that we cannot have face to face. It is forbidden in UNICEF uh, program implementation. And so, in various states, uh, there is a system called Rapid Pro. In some state like Maharashtra, it is now used to monitor on real-time basis the, the, the water and sanitation services. And now it's being scaled up also in, in other states like Andhra Pradesh. Uh, the same system uh, is also used to message, to, for messaging. And today uh, we heard that the cabinet minister urban development uh, from uh, UP uh, adopted that system to really uh, send messages targeting the population in 30 urban slums. And this is 8,000 to 10,000 calls weekly to pass on messages and in a very much integrated approach on, on social distancing, 
health and vaccination, uh, maternal and child nutrition, wash and child protection. So, so this, is, uh, this is one of the changes. The second one is uh, the, the, the type of partnerships. And uh, we have very interesting partnerships with, uh, the, with the corporates, such as Unilever, I mentioned, for the delivery of soap, with j, &J for the delivery of pads, and Nixil for uh, delivery of, um, of uh, taps and hand washing stations. And, um, and, and also much more uh, involvement with NGOs as service providers. And we hope it won't it will continue beyond the COVID era uh, because they bring a lot on the table. Uh, much more on uh, focus on urban areas because this is where we have the hot spot and, and, and focus on urban slum and we are very happy to get there. And finally, the public-private partnerships, not with corporates, but all this work around skilling, licensing, regulation to mobilize small-scale service providers. Uh, we have uh, partnerships, I mean, we are building that with Gates Foundation for fecal sludge management systems. This is with SMEs. And then we are working very closely with the Ministry of Panchayati Raj to build the same type of uh, partnerships at the GP level with individuals, but not any individuals, professional, skilled, licensed individuals which have, which have a contract and a, remuner a remuneration based on performances. So these are the main adaptations that, uh, that were brought by, by, by COVID in our work. Thank you. Uh, wow, th that, that, that's very impressive. Actually, one just one quick follow-up. You mentioned this, uh, this overview that you can get online on water and sanitation services. Um, yes. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, so, so how, if, if, I'm, if I'm, I live in, in Maharashtra or, or somewhere else, I mean, so, or, or, you know, um, where would, what would this tell me and how would I use it and where would I go? So uh, it's, it's in, for now in four districts and it's scaling up. So there is a repository which is, I guess, open source in the hand of the government of Maharashtra and where they have regular question and feedback about the, the continuation of the services. So this one is used for monitoring the continuation of services in Maharashtra and other states are starting to adopt it. In UP, it was adopted, but only one way, it's to message. It's not a monitoring tool. It's the same platform, but just to message in urban slums. So uh, I, can, I, can, I can share the links on the, the platforms where you can see those data going on live. Great, yes, wonderful. I think this is this is great to get this kind of information to, to, our, to our audience. Uh, excellent. Um, let me move straight on uh, to Mera. Um, you know, the question for you is when we open back up, what do you think will be the most important activities to encourage people to gain access to individual household toilets? I think you, you, you alluded to some of them, but, uh, but now you get a minute to, 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 yeah. to go into I, uh, Thanks. Way. Yeah, I already alluded to uh, the points that were there in this. Uh, I just wanted to alert that my team member has put the document on this exactly on this topic that what are the measures needed for increasing access to individual household toilets in urban areas and that we uploaded that i think they've also put the link what you requested on our past work as we refer to its performance assessment system so both are there i think there is also a document on access to credit for toilets that i mentioned that is also updated there so just to I mean, it's the same thing if you, I can just quickly say the three points that I had earlier also. Uh, the first is one thing that I maybe didn't mention and maybe let me highlight only that. The other two of credit and access to sewerage I already mentioned and they are there in the uh, things that were uploaded. But one thing that government of India says you can have community toilet if you don't have enough space in your house. And this is something that we have been objecting to quite a lot uh, because we find that this whole notion that there is no space in the house is also a notion that's coming from outside. Uh, we worked it and documented and our students have documented all over Maharashtra where women have put toilets in very small houses quite successfully. And these are quite well documented and again available for people to see. And this is also comes out of our architecture background to some extent. And what we are now trying to do is to trying to convert this into some kind of a guideline for what measures and what uh, rules can be followed while doing this in very small houses. 
So that's something that we feel is can certainly happen, and that's a new area. That and other areas I've already talked about, so I don't want to repeat that. Maybe the only other thing to highlight is that uh, this notion of uh, two things. One is the NGO as a uh, builder is something that we have sort of. We also are in a way NGO. We are non-profit agency, but our role has never been to build anything. We actually uh, support. We facilitate local government or other service providers to do their work better. And I think that is the notion of within course NGO that needs to be understood better. Most corporates don't understand this at all. They want to support NGOs. Uh, that can go and build toilets and that can go and build so that is the notion that i think needs to be understood a little better and developed further also thank you great thank you very much uh mira and, and adding to the list of the, the sort of the, the size of house should not be sort of necessarily a, a constraint so that was a, the third area beyond beyond credit and, and access to sewage uh let me add, uh, then come to sumitra for the last question um on uh, basically what system, uh, systemic issues that have come to light uh, can we start to address now and moving forward? It's a huge question, but, but still keep you to the a very short answer. Uh, probably I'll just use an example to address what I have to say. So um, beginning at um, where we left off, Marie, uh, on monitoring and evaluation, I think the solution is a marriage between monitoring and evaluation. What I mean is that uh, we have discussed extensively about identifying the problem and uh, establishing what is happening. But for us to understand why that uh, as those issues exist and why those problems are coming up, for example, Meera was talking about smart cities. So Pune uh, actually tracks uh, footfalls in public toilets. So once we observe that the footfalls have, say, for hypothetically reduced, so then uh, what are the reasons? Is it because of lack of proper operations and maintenance within those uh, community toilets? Or is it a behavioral change aspect? For that, we need a holistic evaluation of what other factors can be observed and also triangulate the causes and establish that causality and hence come to a problem. So right now, is it ONM or is it behavioral change or both that we need to tackle? So hence, uh, the marriage between monitoring and quick evaluations, like you uh, explained, is something that could be taken up. And then we can establish what needs to be done. For example, if ONM requires making available locally produced uh, cleaning products, so then the linkage between skilling of local SHGs to produce soap or cleaning products to uh, you know procurement within sanitation services needs to be established right now to get that done but also going forward uh, we need to establish longer behavioral change aspects that need to be looked in so probably i'll just close here if you unless you have more specific questions no i, I think that's that's excellent i mean i think that is so important you see so many programs that sort of have ready-based solutions without having local diagnostics. So you have to have, as you're saying, local diagnostics, and you have to think through the theory of change and, and test it. I mean, that, that's how, and it's an ongoing, uh, um, ongoing right. process. So excellent point. Like ONM, we knew that ONM has been something that we need to focus on, but this establishes very clearly that the systems have to be resilient in the ONM aspect. So that's the major point. No, thank you very much. So, so now what I'll, I'll uh, will do, uh, I, I have a few questions from the audience. I also want to say, I see a lot of activity on the chat, but, but, but there's only a few in the Q&A. And I remind you, the audience, that is in the Q&A, you put the, the questions. Um, my, so my team asked me to remind you of that. Um, what we'll do now is I want to see if anybody in the panel wants to sort of uh, ask a question of anybody else. And then I will read uh, a few of the audience questions, and then each of you will get uh, a chance to address uh, the, the questions you'd like, so to speak. Any questions between the panelists? You're all experts uh, and, and passionate about this field. Any, anybody want to question uh, any of the others? Good, 
it's not a question but it was a response to what nikola said about uh, service providers and particularly private service providers uh, this is i think crucial in the sanitation space especially fssm space and this is something that we have been trying to do as you know the desludging activity is largely private sector dominated although it is about 50 50 in uh, maharashtra but we are trying to introduce a service called scheduled desludging in one of uh, two of the cities in maharashtra and now probably will be taken state wide where a private sector player has been uh, uh, contracted with a performance based contract and and linked to payments by the local government and no user charges so it's a quite a new system that has worked well ministry of urban development has now said this is a good model and they want to introduce it elsewhere also so that's one thing and second thing i wanted to highlight was that uh, in terms of spm please try to make it as a question to to any of the other panelists okay uh, the thing is that if any of you have faced problems because under spm uh, they had ruled out that tenure is not an issue as far as uh, incentive can be given for household toilet uh, in maharashtra we have faced a lot of problems in many and mumbai itself is a good example even but even smaller cities where tenure still remains a problem and i don't know whether that is true in rural what happens whether tenure is an issue or not and how do you resolve something like that okay so that's great great question so the question of tenure and, and is that a sort of widespread uh, issue will you you you'll then uh, give me a second and i will introduce a few questions from the the, the audience uh, and thanks audience for your patience there's a question from pankaj patnoy not addressed to anyone specifically what do you expect the impact of this to be on women who have the primary responsibility for fetching water for domestic use will this affect overall toilet use too the first question the next one is a question from sultanat kasi to ruhi you raised very important sops related uh, so standard operating procedures related to community toilets is there any work done for schools given that they are opening up in several states next question is from gauri chandra also not addressed to anyone specifically um apart from the size of the pits what are some of the common misconceptions that hinder toilet use um parenthesis perhaps regarding cleanliness um then there is a question from charlotte uh, to the panel uh, we solve new challenges with new approaches and technologies are there any new or not and novel approaches that you find exciting are there any specific challenges that you think would lend themselves well to innovation um and finally a question from guari chandra uh, also not to address to anyone specifically so so uh, what are the best ways to measure toilet use self reports are affected by social desirability bias are there any measures for studying the actual behavior um and and that's that's an excellent question and 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 i, I may uh, also ask see if charlotte who's who's been leading uh, the the uh, uh, latrine news program from 3ie may want to come in on that as well um uh, but let me let me then um i'll go around the sun so to speak uh, how you appear on my uh, on my screen uh, so let me start uh, with uh, ruhi yes um so with regard to the question from kazi about the schools and the sops so i honestly don't know if there are any specific ones related to toilets but who does have guidance to schools as they are opening up now uh, after uh, having been shut up for a long while and i'm pretty sure that there may be sort of um, guidelines within that which talk about toilets and more sort of general uh, guidelines as well uh, so i think that that might be helpful and i think there was something not just from wh actually there is something from the unicef specifically in the context of schools which might again have a section on toilets yeah uh 
Um, uh, should I take the one about the other misconceptions uh, about hindering toilet use? Because the 3IE yeah. funded study that we did. Uh, so you're absolutely right, uh, Gauri, uh, that uh, there are these misconceptions, first of all, you know, uh, about uh, the fact that the pit might get filled much earlier, uh, which I already talked about. And then uh, about uh, uh, the fact that, uh, and some of these may not just be misconceptions, but they might be actually coming from a number of uh, other uh, sort of, you know, influences. One is, of course, with regard to the smell and mosquitoes, which are real concerns, yeah? Uh, so, which is why ventilation is important. The way the toilet is constructed is important. Um, and the other barriers we found was also uh, a kind of cognitive uh, uh, barrier which associates toilet use more with people who are uh, weak or vulnerable or old or women. And a lot of that came from the initial uh, messaging and advertising that we had, which was focused on, you know, how uh, toilet use was linked to the gharki izzat and the gharki bahu. And then I think gradually when the government also began realizing that this is sort of then promoting the message of use more for women rather than for everybody in the household, then the messaging started changing. So there are those kind of uh, misconceptions as well. And with regard to cleanliness, uh, it's um, more of a real thing really, unless uh, you know people do, uh, with individual toilets, it's, it's easier because it's under them and then they can clean the toilet. Uh, but of course, with community toilets, then it becomes much more difficult unless the community is involved or there are systems in place. So that's about the question on misconceptions. And the other question from Gauri, which uh, maybe Charlotte will add to as well, but again, in our uh, 3Is related study, uh, to get around this uh, uh, very difficult uh, aspect that, you know, self-reports may result in social desirability bias, especially given that SBM, with SBM, there was a sense of shame now being associated with uh, not using a toilet. One of the things which we did was that uh, we had uh, technical advice from the from RICE, uh, Research Institute for Compassionate Economics, which was helping uh, 3IE with this particular program. And uh, we had sort of two or three questions related to toilet use, which asked about the use of toilets in different ways. And then we tried to sort of triangulate that. So one was, when did you last use the toilet? Then the other was, uh, you know, in the last 24 hours, when did you use the toilet? And then the other was, do you usually use the toilet? So trying to have this question in different ways and then trying to compare the answers. Uh, and then the other thing which has been used sometimes is a kind of uh, uh, something which automatically sort of, you know, when the door opens, sort of clicks over kind of things, these sort of automated things. Uh, and then there's, of course, the use of these kind of CCTV kind of things which click, but which is not really considered uh, very appropriate. Uh, but there are these sort of toilet use uh, door opening related counters, but I'm not very really sure how effective uh, those have been. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was also told early, earlier days there was a, you know, there were there were some studies that were conducted around um, looking at the the amount of, of, uh, of fecal matter on the, on the mosquitoes' legs, but it's a quite complicated oh way goodness. <laughs> of, of, of measuring, so to speak. But I've heard that that has been done too. Let me um, let me go over to you, Raman, for for to address any question. Uh, yeah. So I was looking at the question answer, uh, you know, box. So there are some important questions I think I should uh, respond to. Uh, one, uh, I'll pick up Meera's question and, uh, you know, that very quickly, uh, they, yes, you know, the tenure issue is, uh, you know, coming as a problem across, whether it is rural or urban. So what we need to do is, this, you know, we need to also understand the street level bureaucracy while we are talking about the national guidelines, how to translate things uh, at the, uh, you know, uh, at the end of uh, service level is something that we need to think about. So maybe some district level interventions are needed for both urban and rural uh, settings, I understand. And coming to one important question on the operation and maintenance systems. A very recent study that we did in uh, Orissa and Bihar, two districts each, 
uh, we found that the operations may and maintenance of specifically the institutional toilets schools anganwadis and health facilities are creating a lot of problems because the unit cost that has been provided by the specific programs uh, for these facilities are much lesser than what it is required so unless and until innovative ways of uh, now unfortunately we don't have the mp lad also that has also gone Uh, at, at least you know we could have gone to the mps but that's not going to work mlas probably that is not going to work so the 15 finance commission or you know similar kind of decentralized financing that the urban local bodies and the rural local bodies can uh, actually rely upon how to ensure that their planning covers the operations and maintenance of uh, at least institutional facilities and uh, you know those uh, sanitation facilities is important and the third one is about the cost dynamics which is uh, i think an important question that has been raised so we are as part of a uh, project that we are doing on uh, rights and freedoms of uh, women engaged in manual scavenging in india uh, one of the major problem that we are seeing is that this uh, we we talk about this intersectionality of uh, gender and uh, 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 overall usage and all that but here we need to also talk about the intersectionality of gender caste and also the work related dignity so three issues together is creating a ma major problem in this so unless and until uh, this caste dynamics is realized and accepted as a problem and then you know we need to try to solve the problem from that caste uh, lens as well probably many of the questions of the sanitation workers are and their dignity are going to remain so it is in, in important that uh, you know we promote we incentivize Uh, currently that is missing we don't incentivize the uh, you know uh, supporting of the sanitation uh, sanitation workers or manual scavengers uh, to identify them and then to promote their alternative livelihood or rehabilitation we need to incentivize that and also we need to make those people who are you know those people culpable who are not actually implementing the law so we should be having provisions for this i would uh, stop there though there are some other points also i want uh, one more point is about the school uh, you know there is a campaign that we are uh, going to launch in a very i mean in a week time that campaign is uh, going to launch about what all are the preparedness that needs to be done in school uh, sanitation in school hygiene so probably we'll have a lot of material open access material available in seven languages uh, for you know promoting the school level sanitation in a sooner date yeah thank you great and and any any anything you want to share with the audience in terms of that upcoming campaign uh, as well as the, if you want to sort of uh, uh, use our 3i's uh, twitter twitter handle if you want us to sort of help uh, spread spread the word um let me i'm i'm just following the you want to respond to that mira or No, just a very quick that in terms of the uh, school and health related facility the uh, sanitation facilities many local governments in urban areas have uh, contracts for management of their community toilets and we, one of the cities where we work we have worked with the local government to include all the school toilets in that contract and that has actually made a huge difference it may be a very simple solution that actually and it doesn't make that much of a difference financially for the urban local government to do that and it really could make a big difference just great uh now uh, let me move to nicholas all right a few answers on on how to monitor things uh uh, unfortunately for the usage of toilets you have to look for traces of authentication and i would advise you to use children for that uh, you go in a, in a green village and ask ask them where are the people um, where are the open defecators going and usually they will point you in the right direction uh, and then you look at the toilet if it's used but you cannot know if it's used by every member of the household so that's a difficulty that's why you need to look for the traces of authentication school wash and wash in healthcare facilities there are protocols sops the ministry of human resources development ministry of health have been working on them they are being disseminated they are available and uh, of course the, these are generic ones you can customize it to the local context that's very important to customize and then two final answers um, so i appreciate that. i mean as we are talking about scale i just uh, uh, have a, a bit of a blanket approach for the two issues raised on you know water for sanitation i would say for the for this one look we have a jgm program that proposes tap water to each and every household uh, and, and 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 budgeted for let's make the best out of that yes the returning migrants will will provide more burden to the to the to the women to fetch water but uh, uh, so we can you know have firefighting and we need that now 
to, to support them, and let's make the best in the next three to four years to provide water supply. And the second one, it's also a blanket uh, approach on, on, on the issue of uh, manual scavenging, and it's all the professionalization of the sector. It works better now with uh, uh, SMEs, but uh, really, like we have been working with the Ministry of Panchatiraj for service level benchmark of water and sanitation at the GP level in the hand of the PRIs and the GPs and contractual models with, you know, what is the, the how should the, the person be equipped? How is, what is the remuneration? And, and it's not like you just appoint a guy and pay him from time to time. You appoint the person, equip, train, and, and, and so, it's starting, so it will take a bit of time, but you know, by cross learning on best practices, and also because the government is really struggling to go to re retrieve the 24 points of GDP which were lost because of COVID. If we support those initiatives um, or, uh, with, uh, with, uh, pro by promoting livelihood, combining, uh, combining uh, service provision, not only for water and sanitation, with employment and livelihood, we can, we can get there. And let's not be shy with this. This is not privatization of the public sector. This is professionalization. The leadership stays in the hand of the public sector and the communities with the right contractual arrangement. This is a public service for the people, by the people, but you professionalize it. You stop doing uh, uh, bits and pieces and then, and, then, and then the facilities decay. And I think that's a, a blanket solution that can help to also address the issues of the sanitation workers. Thank you. Wonderful. No, th thank you very much for addressing that, that uh, in important question. Uh, let me uh, go on. Merad, you already had one comment here. I, did there, was there any other question you wanted to uh, address? Or, uh... No, I'm good. Okay, great. Okay. If there is then, any, I would be happy to answer. Okay, Th thank you. Then we'll, uh, uh, let me move to Sumitra. Um, I'll take up the uh, impact on women question first. So I'll probably, uh, since Nicholas already uh, elaborated specifically on the water part, I'll probably take it up from uh, the second part of the question that was posed more on, you know, the burden on women for fetching water or, you know, the drudgery involved in it, but also from the equity perspective that when you're designing, say, since we're talking about community toilets in particular, are we, uh, you know, creating the right uh, numbers of toilet for men and women separately? Because women need more time and uh, women uh, take more time in, uh, you know, it, it, like in the menstruating phase or specifically. So are we giving them enough toilets equitably? That is the first. Second is the burden on women for fetching water and, you know, bringing in that concept. So it's also like Nicholas said, JJM is giving a 50 is uh, talking about providing 55 LPCD, which is uh, the sufficient amount of water for domestic use. So then uh, that would reduce, but also let us look at it holistically. Let's approach the whole concept from a gender equity and also providing safe um, opportunities for women to uh, you know adopt sanitation practices. And secondly, on the data part, um, you know, what kind of data is best used for uh, best for measuring toilet use? Again, I think this this is coming from the last year's 3IE discussion, wherein it was, uh, you know, emphasized quite well that it's not just toilet use that we are going to measure, but also citizens using toilets the other way around, because if you know, not all members of the family probably use the toilet, but the toilet itself might be used uh, on all days. So, you know, changing the dialogue from actually infrastructure utilization to actually changing people's behavior would be important. And for that, we can use multiple methods to triangulate that information, not just self-reporting administrative data or self-reporting by citizens, but social audits or, uh, you know, take up sensor-based information like they do in smart cities. So triangulation of data will validate all these sources. And uh, finally, on the technology part, like are we doing something innovative? So there are a lot of players who are bringing in, uh, you know, uh, cost-effective technologies. For example, uh, if you're using remote sensing data, then um, and there was this um, uh, university professor who discussed with us how he's using infrared imagery in the early hours of the morning 
to measure open defecation because in the fields if you can uh, map heat signatures so it doesn't violate with the privacy of the people but still gives you uh, the measure of like open defecation how it has been practiced and this is real time and you can change uh, you can measure the behavior directly rather than using proxy measures so those are three points that i wanted to add if there is anything specific maybe i can come back in later You are, you are on mute. Mary. Yeah, <laughs> I did it too. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for those additions. We, we're running out of time. I want to just add one question and just have a, whoever is the fastest at wanting to answer it will get to answer it. Uh, uh, it's from Nita Gu, who, who actually used to work with 3IE and is now uh, with Gates and was she was uh, involved in, in, uh, in, in leading our this latrine news program. So some of you will know her well. Uh, she asks, India does not report G, uh, JMP indicators for SDGs. How can we do better? Okay, uh, Mary. I, okay, I well, so well, I answer well, because okay, this is... You very quickly. Mary, no, sorry, it's JMP. Just to say... Sorry, just interrupt. to... Sorry, Nicola, you go first after you. No, go for it, Mera, go for it. No, just very quickly that, in fact, we are working with... Uh, are the pass the performance assessment system that I talked about? We have it includes all the service level benchmarks, but we've also introduced new indicators there to capture the safely managed sanitation. So at least for 6.2, we can capture the entire for urban uses. And in fact, we have a report on Maharashtra. So whoever has asked the question, if they write to us, uh, we will share. The, the report is already available for Maharashtra. And in fact, I would like to request Sumitra ji to maybe have a dialogue later on, on these because SDG monitoring is important. And we are trying to do that for water also, but that we still haven't cracked. But sanitation, yes, we have. Uh, okay, great. Quick, a quick answer. Uh, India data are published in the GMP report. Kindly check, they are there for rural water supply and sanitation and for school wash, that data here. And, and, and we, we're struggling with washing healthcare facilities because we cannot access the Kaya Kalp data, which is very difficult to go on public domain. It's a bit sensitive about health facilities, but for schools, households, in terms of water sanitation, India uh, is featured there, their data are published. Yeah, if I may, rural is there. Nicola is absolutely right. But that is based on only one time survey that was done in five or six states. No, no, so, it's a trend. It's yeah, a trend. no, no, I know 100%. The JMP reporting is for rural is not based on any countrywide thing. It is based on surveys that were done in few states. And but they've accepted that as a... NFHS, okay, NSSO, so I think if, uh, it, it looks like there's some <laughs> disagreement, but if somebody can share with the audience the best It's online. Links it's all there. To... Okay. Um, also, uh, just one simple point to add here. Niti is also doing voluntary SDG monitoring. So India is taking forefront in there as well. So this whole process has moved on. So now we are doing voluntary SDG reporting. So that report again is available online. So I would encourage the participants to look at it. Meera will take up the conversation. Let me ask if Charlotte, is, do you want to come in on anything? Is there anything we've, we've forgotten to mention that, that you'd like to add before I wrap up? Um, so just that we have a study published that compares um, different ways of questioning or different ways of asking the question about latrine use and how you can get very different results based off of how you ask that question. And so if you want to go take a look, it's posted on the website. Um, and I think the results are very interesting. Great. And that's Charlotte Lane from uh, Evaluation Specialist from 3IE. Uh, yes, yeah, so please do have a look uh, at, at that study. Now, um, Basically, I will draw this to the close. We were planning to also have a wrap up of wrap ups, etc. I think we, we have had an amazing discussion. You, you have, it's, uh, it's clear that you're all very passionate about this and, and, and for very good reasons. Um, we, we've, uh, we've heard from, uh, from all of you that you know, COVID-19 has definitely posed some threats uh, to increase, uh, increasing latrine use. Uh, I, I think one point made by Ruhi is also about the 
the possible slippage in behavior because be some behaviors are not, you know, are quite recently acquired. I thought that was also a very, very uh, interesting point. Um, but then we've also heard from all of you about, uh, you know, the knowledge we have about how to do this better and, and the tools, you know, the monitoring, the evaluation tools, everything we have at our disposal to, to find out how to do it better, how to diagnose better, how to learn better. Uh, and bring all of these tools to uh, to inform uh, the phase two of SDM, and also bring bring this uh, to our work in terms of of uh, getting out of the siloed approach. I think that came out uh, very clearly. Bring in the various programs, bring in uh, you know the the private uh, sector in terms of service provision, uh, etc. All, all, all very uh, very uh, interesting, and I think pr promising. Uh, things that we can learn and bring into the into uh, the work and the behavior change that that uh, that we need to continue to to support going forward. Um, so just uh, with this, uh, would like to thank uh, this this distinguished panel for all of your your work, your passion, and and your contributions to to today and uh, to the entire uh, 3IE team uh, behind uh, the scenes who have made this uh, this event uh, possible. And finally, uh, wishing you a good hand washing day on October 15th, I think uh, that Nicholas uh, uh, confirmed. Um, and, uh, and see you all, I hope, on, on the social media around this. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Good day. And thanks to the audience for great questions. <laughs>